Of how we leave is how we enter. Um, last week we looked at from really from Psalm 133 about um, you know, really? Psalm 133 about how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And <clears throat> we looked at the word yeah, dwelling, meant to be without strife, conflict, or fighting, and the word unity meant to be in harmony, to be as one. And you know, one thing I've got to scribble down here that I've added in the week is outwardly, we can say and do the right things to people. That's called religion. We can say and do the right things to people, but inwardly, inwardly, our lives contradict that. But we say we say the right thing and we do the right thing. So for some, we get deceived. Because we think, oh, because that they're saying the right thing, they're doing the right thing, that must be great. When really, God knows the motives and desires of every person's heart. Yeah. And not every person's desire and motive is godly. Yeah? yeah. Yes, Keith. Yeah. Yes, Keith. Yeah. I'll talk to myself. What do you think? It's good, Keith. Yeah. 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 So I said that unity is the outcome of the environment we create. So if we want unity as a group of people, we've got to create an environment of love. Forgiveness, patience, kindness. So we don't criticize, we don't gossip. You know, sometimes our hearts can be incredibly wicked. Our hearts can be incredibly wicked for whatever reason. And yet we don't always know that. We don't always see it. But you know, one thing that unity does do, got it there, is to protect us from evil. Because when we are uni in unity as a group of people, we don't allow people to tear somebody else down. You know that, Debbie? What do you yeah. think about Debbie? I don't like it. Them socks and them shoes. <laughs> don't like it. You know, we can, we can tear people down. And if, but if we walk in unity, look at those socks. If we walk in unity, <clears throat> it protects us as a group of people. Yeah. Because we say, I ain't going to let Steve criticize Derek. <laughs> I'm going to stand up for him because he's part of his family. And we don't allow people to do that. Because you know what? When you go from this, and believe it or not, you may not really realize this, but we're going to a whole new level when we leave here. We're not leaving this place and just going to the same place. God has taken, you know, this baffled me. I'm like, why are we going from a room this big to a room that's probably four times as big? We don't fill this one. Why has God taken us to a room that's four times bigger than the one we're in, with extra rooms and more toilets to clean? You know what I mean? Why, why, is, why is God doing that? And why not just, well, just stay here. Just stay here. He said, no, no, I, I want to take it. Because he wants to elevate us to a new place. He wants to take us to a place where more people will come in. Yeah? Yes. They yes. might think, well, you know, it's baffled me that when we started, every week there were people walking through that door. And then that hasn't happened for a while. But what I have noticed is that people who are not on the same page as us, and people who don't have the same spirit as us, don't stay with us. Yeah? And I, it's not a criticism or anything like that, but some come to stay, some come to leave. Yeah, it, it does make sense to think about it. Some come to stay, some come to leave. And you know, whenever that happens, it's sad. But you know what? God God wants to in the place. John said he came to me last Monday morning and said, anyone, everyone who's left before, he said, I think he said, correct me, was perhaps those people who are not going to walk in unity, they will bring disunity. And I, and I think... You know, God sees a bigger picture. God knows what's going on. But I'm convinced by a shadow of a doubt that we'll go to a new place with new people, a, a new anointing. Some of you will have heard a prophetic word that came to me last Monday at 12.35 in the afternoon from a guy in London who I've only seen for a, a few minutes on Zoom. And he, he sent me this, a word that was nearly four minutes long about, about you having a new build with a new anointing and new people new ministries, all, all manner of things that he was saying. 
He didn't know about the building. He didn't know about what we do. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know you. He doesn't know what we're talking about. But then he was saying that revival would come in that building. Yeah. That's what we've been saying since since day one. Yeah. Revival would come in, in, in that building. Yeah. And as a church, we God would elevate us to national prominence in the in, in the nation. Ooh. Now listen, stuff like that don't I don't get a big head on stuff like that because I know that when you get to something like that, you get a few more challenges that come. And I don't like challenge. You know what I mean? I just want I'd rather keep away from stuff like that. But if, if that's what God if that's where God wants to take us, then we have to go with that. I, I just have to toughen up a bit. You know, because no one likes a challenge that comes with something like that, because challenges will come. Different challenges. Well, you know, one thing I do know, that unity will protect us from the evil. Yeah. And, you know, we will not let people destroy things. Because, you know, I've talked about, I've mentioned the Absalom spirit before. I mentioned the Bible school, I mentioned it briefly here. That spirit that is unleashed always works through a person who is rejected and hurt to undermine the leaders and to destroy the church. I've seen it happen years ago. Many years ago, many years ago, he destroyed a church. A couple came, took everybody with them, without the pastors knowing, until that they all went. Saying things behind the scenes, not being honest, being a bit deceitful, acting like the victim, acting like everybody was against them, when none of that was the case. Deceived everybody. So when that, when things like that get unleashed against you, that's been a that that's been an issue for months here, and I can honestly say, and, I, and I'm not saying this for any reason other than this. I said to Jenny in the week, I said, "We passed the test, did I not?" Mm. And I'm not saying that to boast. Ooh, you know what? If you want to go to the next level, we are going to have to pass a test. If you want to pass your O levels, you got to pass them before you can do your A levels. If you want to do a degree, you got to pass your A levels before you can do a degree. You know what I mean? Before you can be a consultant, John, you've got to qualify anyway. You've got to put the hours in. You've got to pass all those tests and exams that come your way before you can get to that, the dizzy heights of a consultant. Every one of us has a test to pass. And you know what? I have noticed in church life, some people don't pass those tests. In fact, some people don't want to even take the test. So then they leave. But everyone has an opportunity to pass the test. And you know what? No one ever goes to the next level until they pass that test. And God will take anyone around the mountain, as Joyce Mayer would say, around the mountain, and around the mountain, and around the mountain, however many times, until you take the test and pass the test. We can walk away, we can blame somebody, blame anybody, but until we pass that test, no matter how good we think we are, God is not going to elevate anybody. It does happen. But well, thankfully, thankfully, we as a group of people are passing the test of unity. Yeah. We're passing that test. And it's been our job to protect you from disunity. I said to Jenny, I said, I, I, I've looked back at the style of message that I've taught this last year. And it came to me when I was preparing this on Tuesday. Keith, that your style of message is now going to change. And how you deliver and what you say will change. And I'm like, what's that? Because you've been preaching not to people, but against evil spirits that have been watched and listening. Now you've dealt with that. You aren't going to deal with them anymore. You can teach and your style will be now different because you're not addressing those things anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. Now don't be... Disillusion to think, you know, God talks to me every two minutes because that ain't the case. So I ain't one of them people who's going to stand up and say that because that, that, you know, that really doesn't happen. But I am aware enough to know that as a church, God has given us a building because we have passed the test. He can then trust us with that. And it's not, like I say, it's not ours, it's ours, it's everybody's. You know, don't think, oh, this is Keith and Jenny. It ain't Keith and Jenny. It's everybody's. Yeah. Everybody's. If you break a window, you'll pay for it. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah? But I want to look at the second half of Psalm 133 this morning and talk about the anointing. Because the anointing...
comes as a result of unity. And this becomes important because we read how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell in together in unity. And we are, you know, people are, you know, we pull up with, you know, the Bible talks in Romans, to some water, the Bible talks in Romans about patiently putting up with people. And we patiently put up with Catholic all the time, <laughs> you know, until God changes that, we pull up with Catholic, you know? We pray for Julia daily. <laughs> We've known her all her life. Thank God have mercy. <laughs> but, you know, we, it says in verse 2, the last word in verse 1 said, for brethren to dwell together in unity. The first words, the first few words, it is like. So unity is like the precious oil upon the head. Okay? So unity is like the anointed oil. So if you want unity, if you have unity, you'll have the anointing. If you have the anointing, you have unity. Because the and unity is like the oil. So unity and the anointing go together. They go together. And that word like means having the same characteristics and qualities. So unity is like, it, is, it has the same qualities and characteristics as the oil upon his head that runs down of Aaron's garments. Yeah? So unity and the anointing. Go to, so we pray for the anointing. And you know, sometimes we don't need to pray for the anointing. We just need to be in unity. Yeah? I know that sounds crazy. We don't need to pray for some things. It's just that the, you know, unity, it's like the anointing. It's the same. So if you want the anointing, walk in unity. Bingo. You, you, you have that. Now, just as a bit of information, who was Aaron? Aaron, he says, it's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron or Aaron, depending on how you say it. Who is he? He's Moses' brother from the tribe of Levi. Levi. He had uh, two sons, Nadab, Abihu, and he was called to serve God at 83 years of age. Now that covers everybody in this room and in fact scholars when you research Aaron scholars will say that when Moses had his experience with God in the burning bush that's the same time that God called Aaron even though it's not written there if you research they say that now Aaron was always known as a peacemaker and he was a high priest of Israel the Israelite priesthood and he was the first person to wear the priestly garments which is interesting because, oh, is it? okay, I thought we got something for it. He's the first, but now why is it, why is that important if he's the first person to wear the priestly garments? Because his priesthood paved the way for Christ to be our high priest. Because he wore those priestly garments, he was a mediator for the Israelites. Who was Jesus? Or who is Jesus? He's our mediator. Yeah, and yet his Aaron's weakness was that he questions Moses' leadership, and that left him with leprosy. Yeah. So, what's the significance of this? Who is the head of the church? We said this last week. Who's head of the church? Jesus. Jesus. Who is the body? Us. We are. Therefore. The anointing flows from Christ down to the body, Sing, signaled, signified in this, it is like the precious oil upon Aaron's beard running down on the garments. So his garments represent the body, there's a head which is Christ and the anointing flows down. Now, who is the head of the local church? Here will be Jenny and myself. So, the anointing runs down from Jesus. He pours out the, the anointing. It flows through us to you. Now, why is that important? It's not important because of, I want you to do as I say. It's important because I've said this a few times before. It's important who you relate to. If you relate to somebody who's dodgy, you will be you will start to take on the characteristics of that person that you're submitted to. 
yeah? If you follow someone who, and I've got, I've got this written down here, if you follow a pastor who loves his wife, who is honest and hungry for God, you will become like that person, like your leaders. It's a natural thing. We were in a church years ago, and the pastor there used to punch filing cabinets, throw computers around the office, and things like that. I said this to Jenny, I'm, I'm being honest now, we were there for a period of time. I started to get angry at everyone. Because I was becoming like the person that I was submitted to. Now you might think that's a, but it becomes important. So if the pastor you're submitted to is a dope, doesn't read the word, doesn't pray, you too will start to be like that. If you get a pastor who, who is a bit of a dodgy character, you'll start to take on those characteristics. So it's important who you submit to. That's the point, that's what, that's what I'm saying. I'm not beating you up to say, you must submit to me. I, but you become like the person that you follow. The Bible says that, there's all sorts of things in the New Testament to talk about that. So it's important that in the, in the local body, one, that, that puts me and Jenny under a lot of pressure, not pressure, but pressure, to make sure that we follow God correctly, that we see God correctly, that Jenny doesn't beat me up all the time, and things like that in the marriage, but we are honest. Some of you think I'm serious, it's a joke. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, we, we do things quickly. Why is that important? Because that models it to you, and then that's what you follow. That's what you follow. You know, so, it, the anointing, there's, see, we just think we can turn up and do what we want, it doesn't matter. But it's important, and I'm not folk, I'm not emphasizing the submission thing, but I, I am saying this, those you submit to, you become like. In a good way or a bad way. And if the people you follow are good, and I'd like to think, I'm not quite about, but I'd like to think that Jenny and I follow God with all our hearts to the best of our ability. But if you don't want to do that, then you leave. That's the only way it is. You know? <clears throat> the anointing will come when we walk in unity. Now, as far as I know, I, my prayer is for God to flow through me to you, for the anointing to flow through us to you. And I don't want anything less. So I don't want anything in me and Jenny to be a hindrance to anything. I don't want us to think something, say something, do something, and then God says, well, I want to move, but it was you, Keith. I don't want that to be the case. I want us to be as, can I use the word, squeaky clean as possible, so that God will flow through us to you. So we're not a blockage. But you know, anyone who is a blockage, I believe that God will remove. God will remove now. The oil, the precious oil upon his head. We know that the, the oil relates to worship to God. And it represents the power and the presence and the spirit of God. Yeah? And the oil was used to consecrate and set apart a person to God. So if you want more of God, this is the best way to put it. You want more of God, you dedicate yourself to him. If you want more of God, then you, when you go home, when you're in your car, then you say, God, I, I surrender myself. We do that when we get saved, and for some of us, we never do it again. But, you know, so re rededicate your life to him. Surrender yourself to him and say, God, I don't want anything to get in, to get in the way of you flowing through me, in my family or in my work even, wherever I am. So that the anointing is, is a result of a person who's dedicated to God. And in this case, the oil was the medium by which the Holy Spirit was released to another person. Because the oil came down upon Evan's head, down his beard, over his garments. From Jesus, over the leaders, to the body of Christ. That's why it's important to be in church. That's why it's important to be in church. Watching it online is a nice thing, but it's a cop-out for many people. Well, I can watch you ever on TV. Of course you can. 
but you ain't there with other people. Iron sharpens iron, we're there, we're getting the rough edges knocked off us, we're learning things, we're growing, we're developing, we're in God's presence together. God will do things when we're together. But we say, no, I'm going to watch it with a cup of coffee and a bit of a you know, crunch of chocolate at home. And I'm going to watch it for half an hour on a Sunday because I can't be bothered. We're missing out. And I don't say that, you're all here, so yeah, you know what I mean? But, you know, we're missing out on being together for the anointing to come down. Oh, no, now, there's, there's various different types of oil. Various different, and I'm getting to a point where I'm going to close, not too long, but then I just want to give you some facts, really. There are different types of oil mentioned in the Bible, from cassia, cedarwood, frankincense you'd have heard of, uh, cypress, gabarium, hyssop, and myrrh. Some of those you'd have heard of. Now myrrh, we all, if I said myrrh, you'd think gold, frankincense, and myrrh, wouldn't you? That's the first thing you think of Christmas. Now, interesting, that myrrh was the first oil that's mentioned in the Bible. Myrrh was also the first oil that, the, that anyone came and gave to Jesus. That is what the wise men bought. But it's also the last oil that was mentioned in the Bible. It's what they gave him. That's what they anointed Jesus with just before he died. So the myrrh was, was the first oil in the Bible. It's what Jesus was given by the wise men and it's what he was anointed with before he died. So this oil is important. These oil types are important because they have done different things. So this, so this is this. Unity is like the oil. Oil, the anointing, is a result of unity. Let's go to Psalm 92. And I want to read some verses from Psalm 92. And this is what's important because this is what happens to us when there's a fresh anointing that comes upon us. Now, I don't live by prophetic words, okay? But what was said, and it's been said a couple of times, actually. But Psalm 92, um, let, let me just read. And I want to read from verse 10. Psalm 92, verse 10. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Now the interest, now this is what happens when you've got a fresh anointing. Now this, this guy has said, prophesied to us, that we get a new building, a new anointing, new people, new ministries, new, many new things. Um, for me, my main concern is the anointing. If I'm going to be honest, that's my main concern. Because when you've got the anointing, you've got God, you've got everything else. So I want the anointing. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Now what happens in verse 11? He says, in, it depending on your translation, he says, my eyes, my eye sees. He says in verse Second half of verse 11, my ears hear. When you get a fresh anointing, you begin to see more, you begin to hear more. When there's a new anointing upon you, you'll see things that you've not seen before, and you'll hear from God things that you've not heard before, when you've got a fresh anointing. Because sometimes, I'm sure you're like me, sometimes things just get stale, don't they? Come on. Yeah, nothing worse than a stale slice of bread. Yeah, just or a stale biscuit, or for Charles a stale donut. <laughs> nothing is worse than something that's stale. But when you get a fresh anointing, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you again, you begin to see things that you've not seen before. You begin to hear things that you've not heard before. Yeah, which for me is exciting because then what happens in verse 12, once you've seen and once you've heard, he says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. So now, because the Bible talks about us, we've talked about this before about us being trees, now we as people 
we are the righteous we begin to flourish like a palm tree flourishes what, what does that mean well a palm tree generally comes in a desert and a palm tree grows in a desert but other trees won't grow in a desert so if you're going to flourish like a palm tree you're going to succeed and do well even if things around you aren't doing well yeah so this is what happens when a fresh anointing comes on you. No, I want, I want a fresh anointing. But then it says also in verse 12 that you will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now I nearly got, I nearly got to go to Lebanon, but it was because of COVID I couldn't go. But a group of people there that I've worked with a lot, and they were going to take me to what is referred in the Bible as the cedars of Lebanon. And these massive trees that you can't put your arms around that have been there for hundreds of years that are quite famous in Lebanon, but, it, but they they stand, you will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. What, what does that mean? These trees in Lebanon are unmovable. Yeah, I just think it's a sad example, but bear with me. When that car hit that tree on Bromley Lane at whatever miles an hour it was going, and those four, four children died in the car, we knew one of them, Izzy, um, I, I knew a granddad. And her parents. But when that car hit the tree at that speed, what did the tree do? Nothing. We took that impact of a high speed car, never budged an inch. So if we are going to be like, if we're going to grow like a cedar in Lebanon, what's that mean? When rubbish comes at you, when difficulties come at you, when things hit you hard, you don't move. You are immovable. You take it on the chin. You ain't going to do a Frank Bruno where you get hit on the chin and end up on the floor within seconds. But you're going to be one of these other fighters that when you get smacked on the chin by a very hard punch, you just take it and destroy it. It doesn't destroy you. Yeah? I know people, uh, when adversity comes their way, they might as well just shoot themselves. And, I, and I'm not being nasty, but it's like they just, they just go into freak mode because something difficult has happened to them. You know what, difficulties come to everybody if you're alive. And you know what, when they come to us, he says, when we have a fresh anointing, even when difficulties come, we will grow strong, immovable, like the cedars of Lebanon. Now I wanna be like that. So when, when that curve ball comes, don't, I don't bat an eyelid. I just carry on going, I don't get affected. I just keep seeking God and fulfilling my purpose. So we, we see more, we hear more, we flourish. But like a palm tree in a desert in difficult times, we still flourish. And when difficulties come our way, we are immovable. And then in verse 13, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. Hey, when a fresh anointing comes on a person, we have a desire to be in church. <laughs> yeah. When, you, when there's a fresh anointing on someone, we don't think, well, well, let's go well, beyond. So I'll go shopping to Agatha today. We have a hunger and a desire to be in church because we are planted. We are planted in the house. This generation, I'm sorry to say, I'm old enough to say that now. I'm getting to that age where I can say stuff like that now. Back in the 70s, back in the 80s, I'm showing my age. People went to church, no matter what happened, they were there. They were turned up faithfully, 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 faithfully. Now, going to church is like, shall I go to Asda or go to Sainsbury's? Or little, or neither, and do it online. What do I do? Ah, oh, I can't be bothered. But yet he says, when there's a fresh anointing on you, why, why, why is that so important? When there's a fresh anointing on you, there's a desire in your heart. That God draws you and says, come on, come, I want to spend time with you. Not out of legalism, not out of duty, not out of someone trying to please me or please anybody. You do it for you. You do it because you want to be there. Because you say, I want to be, you know what, oh, this sounds crazy. But even being at the church yesterday with you guys, some of us sometimes mucking around with Sheila's tickling stick. <laughs> that sounds dodgy. But mucking around with all these things. It was good. I enjoyed it. I know there was work to do, and we had we had work to do, and I was knackered when I got up. Can I say that? Sorry if you want. Anyway, I was tired when I got home. You know what I mean? But I enjoyed it. I could have stayed there all day. It was just fun. 
you know what I mean? People doing a bit, doing this, you know, and all. It, it was fun. I enjoyed it. So, you know, it, it's not even being in a church service. When he says you're planted in the house of the Lord, he's not saying you, thou must come on a Sunday. He's saying be with Christian people where God has placed you, enjoy their company, have a bit of fun, worship me, serve me. We can do this together. And you know what? You don't do it out of duty. You're thinking, I can't wait to get there tomorrow. I want to go again. It was fun. I was tired. I'm knackered. There we go. I said it again. But I was tired. I was tired. But I enjoyed it. Let's do it again. And you want to go again. Because when there's the, uh, it sounds odd to think, going to clean a toilet, what's that got to do with the anointing? Well, some toilets I've seen, you need the anointing to clean the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to be planted in that. When you're planted, in other words, when your roots go down and you those roots go deep into the ground, you think you're sucking on water is a tree. But we are, we are, our roots are deep in the ground and we are sucking on the presence of God. So when Vanessa's running away from the spider, sorry, Vanessa, <laughs> up the corner of the church, and when Kathy's polishing the pews, or John is digging the weeds and getting rid of the box, whatever it may be, the anointing is there. Because the anointing, you can sense it when you're in the building, you can sense the presence of God is there. You know, it's just, it's just fun to be there. But he says, when you're planted, you'll flourish. Flourish, you'll succeed, you'll thrive. Yes. So you know what? Yeah. There's no point praying to flourish and praying to thrive. That comes as a result of being planted in the house of the Lord. Yeah. Sometimes we waste our prayers. You know what I mean? What's the cricket? You, you don't need to pray, God, I want to flourish. It just says, if you want to flourish, plant in the house of the Lord. And then just for Steve, you bear fruit in old age. <laughs> you bear fruit in old age verse 14 he says you will still still bear fruit in old age and you will be fresh and flourishing in other words in other words it don't matter your age god doesn't finish with you when you're 40. it don't matter whether you're 50 60 70 80 90 100 110 120. it doesn't matter what it is the presence of god is there and God will still use us, and God will still energize us, and God will still say, come on, let's be there and be together. That is why these people on the church, we, we can learn from them. Because at 85, they still turn up every week. At 82, they're still there every week. Yeah? And you just think, wow, these people are faithfully, faithfully turning up. They're faithfully. Now, there must be a reason. They ain't doing this out of duty. Because when the, when the numbers fall, because people have passed on, they'll think, oh, forget this. I ain't coming. But these have they've been found faithful. 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 And, you know, I know it sounds daft, but, you know, we were looking through the books and the hymn books and the, the Bibles. For a church, there's more Bibles than the Bible Society. <laughs> but there's, there's thousands of them. But when you read through them, I found one that was dated back to 1909. Was yours 1901? Chris got one that was 1901, 122 years old. So when you think of that, of the heritage of that place and what God has done over the years, you think we are stepping, do you remember, you probably don't remember this, but I, it was November 21 when I quoted something out of the Gospel of John where it says that you will reap where you've not sown. Now, if you can remember that, that message back then. You've got a good memory, I can see. But I said, do you remember it? You reap where you've not sown. And we're going into this place, into a church where they've sown, where they have, you know, given money away to charities and children's homes and, and all this, not charged for anything, but given money. They've been sowing and sowing and sowing and sowing. Then we come along and we reap on the back of what are they what they've sown? Yeah. What an awesome thing! Yeah. Bit of a cheeky one, really, isn't it? You know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> we're reaping on, but we're in a place where we are reaping based on what somebody did in 1901, mm -hmm. 1910. You, you can't even comprehend that, can you? Mm -hmm. Some woman or some man did something. They're sowing, and then a hundred plus years later, we come along. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
that's, that's, that's for me, that's that's boggles my mind. But in going back to this, you'll still bear fruit in old age, you'll be fresh, and you'll be flourishing. Like I said, going back to the beginning where he says, the when the fresh anointing comes upon us, we can see what we've not seen before, we can hear what we've not heard. Some of us here will be deaf, and I don't mean that physically. What I'm saying is, God's been trying to get your attention to say stuff to you, and you haven't been listening properly. Not for any reason other than you've just got to be deaf. When there's a fresh anointing comes on you, you can see things. You'll be like, <coughs> you be like, Eureka moment, I see it now. I heard God say, I woke up and I heard it. I heard this voice. I heard this voice. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, because now there's a fresh anointing. You can see things you've not seen, hear things that you've not heard here. You will flourish like a palm tree. So you'll succeed. Because all this is about succeed, flourishing, thriving. You'll succeed even when everything around you is falling apart. Not you. You're going to succeed. Your business, Chris, will succeed even when other people in your field and in your area don't. You will. Because of the anointing that's on you. Yeah? Those who are will grow like we will grow strong. Immovable. Yeah? No matter what comes our way. We ain't gonna let, get knocked down. We're gonna stand, we're gonna be resilient and keep going. When we're planted in the house of the Lord, we will flourish in the courts of God. And it don't matter what, what age, it don't matter. It doesn't matter what age you are. Bit of Netherton came out in the day. Gotta be careful. Those, we can still bear fruit, don't matter what age we get. Because sometimes you think, oh, it's only young people. We've got to get young people, young people, young people. If we don't have a thousand young people, then we listen, I'm all for young people. But listen to this. You're the people that God has put here at this moment in time. Okay? The young people are coming. The children are coming. But you know what? God bless them. But I'm not going to overlook those who are here for someone who's going to come in the future. Okay, whilst I want them to come and, I will, and, and, and they will come and they too will serve God. They too will grow and be mentored. They too will get married, have children and all the rest of it. We are here today. Yes. And God says, no matter what age you are, you will still flourish. Amen. If you are planted yeah. in the house of God. Yeah. So if you want to flourish, yeah. if you want a fresh anointing, you know what we're going to do. So, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to take communion. Then we're going to have a time of worship. And then we're going to pray for some of you for a fresh anointing to come on your life. Okay? For a fresh anointing to come on you. Why? Because sometimes, and it's true, this isn't a, not a criticism, it's not nothing, it's just life sometimes. We get stale. Yeah, we get our eyes a bit blurry, we can't see properly.